holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed Jesus with her perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their mother, about their brother. Then Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to weep to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
The dead man came out. His hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I grew up in the church. I think you know that. I grew up in a family, parents who took me to Sunday services every week and made me go to vacation Bible school every summer. I went to summer camp out at Shaco Springs near Talladega. I did overnights with the youth group. Whenever we went to Sunday school, We had an assembly. We would get together, all of us, to hear the lesson of the day and to sing songs before going off to our smaller classrooms. We had a children's chapel just like we did. We do now. And like we do now, we say that that service was for kids about three years old to second grade. It was around third grade when we were supposed to age up into big church, just like we say now. I was one of those kids who really liked going to Children's Chapel. I was one of those kids who tried to sneak off to Children's Chapel even though I was too old for it. It wasn't about the preaching. I was a smart kid. I knew what they were talking about. The music was better in Children's Chapel. At least that's what I thought then. I loved this song that we sang I bet you started singing it in your head as soon as the readers started talking about the Valley of the Dry Bones. I know in your head some of you were singing along with the junior choir, right? The foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone's connected, you want to say it with me? The ankle bone's connected to the the leg bone, and the leg bone's connected to the knee bone, all the way up to the head, and then... The prophetic word, hear the word of the Lord. And then, just like they did, we would dance around and pretend like we were skeletons as the preacher for that day would sing the rest of it. Hear the word of the Lord. Do you know where that comes from? Now, if you're an Episcopalian, chances are you might not know the Old Testament, but you know how the bulletin works. So if you check the inside of your bulletin so you could say, Yes, Father Mills, I know exactly where it comes from. It comes from Ezekiel 37. I would say, wow, you are right. That's exactly it. Ezekiel is a great book and a weird book. Ezekiel is a prophet who prophesies during the great exile in the time after the period of the great kings, David and Solomon, after the civil war that divided David's country into north and south after the north and then the south fall to foreign powers and are carted off into slavery. He prophesies about 600 years before Jesus in the time of the great Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel is a priest. He belongs to a priestly family. He's part of that great group of people who have status and education and wealth that are carted off into slavery and he lives in Babylon, in modern-day Iraq. He lives in a time when, for the Jews, hope would have been impossible. The promise to Abraham, and the promise to Moses, and the promise to David, and the promise to all of those to whom God spoke in the past was that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be a special, particular people among all the peoples of the earth, that God would work through them and God would work in them. By being God's own people, with their temple to focus their devotional life and the line of kings to govern and guide them, they would participate in God's love and God's guidance and God's grace, God's grace in a different way. They were to be the people. If you said, what is God doing in the world now, 
the nations would be able to say, look at the Jews. That's where you can see God working and active. If you want to know what faithfulness looks like, what does it mean to be faithful to God? What does God want out of ordinary human beings? You could say, look at the Jews. They are the ones who follow. They are the ones who are faithful. And so after all was gone, after the kings were dead, and the country had fallen, and the temple was destroyed, God takes Ezekiel to this great valley where he sees the dry bones and says to him, come look at this vision of the whole house of Israel. And what Ezekiel sees is truly shocking. Ezekiel doesn't see that people wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. He doesn't see people limping around because half of them wants to follow God and half of them wants to follow the ways of the world. He doesn't see people who are wounded by the ways of the world and by one another. He doesn't even see corpses and skeletons. The great field of battle intact remains of people who need to be healed or raised and rescued. He sees a valley of dry bones, a vision of a people well and truly dead whose history is over. As one commentator puts it, he sees a strewing of human remains no longer even skeletal, so definitely of the past that the bones have separated and preserve no personal identities. One can no longer say, alas, poor whoever, I knew him well. In his exile, far from the land of promise, far from the kings, far from the people that were to be a light under oppressive rule of a foreign pagan power, He sees the people as scattered, as broken, as disjointed, as lacking identity. It's not what a prophet is supposed to see, you know. Prophets are supposed to be the people that tell you what your options are. They're the ones who are supposed to see clearly what the way out is, even when other people can't see it. The word of the prophet is supposed to be persist and perish or repent and live even though the prophets often sound threatening, their word is a word of hope. Continue the way you are, and it will continue to be bad. But God has opened up a way. There's a way for you to move forward into the new kingdom that God has promised. There are two ways. Choose wisely. Ezekiel is given a prophetic word at the very worst time in Israel's history. At a time when It is not clear if anything, anything can fix it. That's why when God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? God is saying to him, what do you see as possible here? What do you think the options are, Ezekiel? What do you see before you? And when Ezekiel says, oh Lord God, you know, it's his way of saying, I don't. I do not see how it can come back together. Ezekiel sees the reality the condition of the people's political life and religious life and spiritual life and national life. And he says to God, I hope you have a plan because I don't. And I'll tell you, I get that part of the story. I get it. I think maybe you do too. I get it when I get up every morning and eventually pull up my news feed. There's something about my news feed that makes me feel as though this is not the way it's supposed to work. I pray for our country. That's the way I'm trained as a priest, as a minister in the prayer book tradition. That's the way we are taught to pray. I pray for the universal church. I pray for the nation and for the world. I pray for the city and the parish and for those who have asked my prayers. I pray for you and your families and things going on in your life. I pray for those who have died. That's the prayer book list. That's the list that trained me and formed me, and that's the list that I pray. And one of the things that I do when I'm stuck and I don't know what to pray for, whether I'm praying liturgically or personally, is I use the pattern of the prayer book. Sometimes I use the pattern, sometimes I use the prayers. When I'm praying for the country and for the world and I'm feeling stuck, I 
like to turn to that little section of the prayer book that starts on page 814. The prayers for the world, for the nation, for social order. They're really good. They're collects. They have a pattern to them that teaches me something about what we believe and pray for as Episcopalians. The way we pray reveals a lot about the theology of our church. Our praying shapes our believing. So when we look at the prayers for the world and for the nation and for social order, we can say, I can say to myself confidently, this is what the Episcopal Church believes God can do and what God has promised. This is the sort of thing that we can ask of God. These are the sorts of things that we promise to do in response to God's action. This is what we promise and God promises will happen as a result of our praying. But I will tell you, now more than ever, I don't read that section of the prayer book and think, man, we are knocking that one out of the park. Well done. We have accomplished. Time to move on. No more need to pray. I feel that way about the church too. That section of those prayers about the church is deeply moving to me. The description of a God who is worthy of worship and who wants all to come to faith and who showers gifts upon the church is a God that I recognize a God that I know and that I believe in. The church that is described there, one that is unified and preaches the word of God faithfully and celebrates the sacraments truly, that strengthens the faithful and rouses the careless, that witnesses to all people, is the church that I believe in, the church that I hope for, the church that I work to make a reality. And it's a church that from time to time I see here. I can see in this place the miracle of God working in people's lives and the miracle of welcome. I see times when word and sacrament and mu movement and music come together and people's hearts are touched and their minds are opened and their lives are changed and their relationships are healed. I see those times when you are strengthened, when you are aroused, when you are brought to penitence. And I hope that you have heard here some good news about the love of Jesus and the life he offers you. I love this church. And because I love this church, I want it to be all that it can be. Not just what it is now, not just what it once was in the past, not what we used to love about it, but what is in our future, what God put into the hearts of those who planted this church 60 years ago. A church that is about prayer book worship and gospel preaching and changed lives in a neighborhood that is different because we are here, because we have learned to love God and learned to love God by loving our neighbor. And I want this church to be everything that God calls us to be, to reach all that God calls us to reach, to love and serve and honor all those whom God sends to our doors. And a little section of that prayer of the prayer book is prayer 11 page 817 that really hits it for me almighty and ever-living god ruler of all things in heaven and earth hear our prayers for this parish family strengthen the faithful arouse the careless restore the penitent grant us all things necessary for our common life bring us to be of one heart and one mind within your holy church. I love that prayer because it puts my prayers in the right order. It teaches me to pray for people before provision, to pray for us as a family before I pray for us as an organization, to pray for my faith to be stronger and your faith to be stronger, for me to know where I have been neglectful and careless and to turn from that, and for you to know where you have been neglectful and careless, where I have gone wrong or you have gone wrong to have the grace to turn back to God. The prayer is a strong statement of grace. It's a prayer that talks about what God does. We ask God to do these things for us. We do not lay out for God our plan to strengthen our faith, but ask God to act in us and among us. It's a list of petitions, of prayers, of intercessions, of things we believe that God and God alone can do. It's a statement of grace, of God's action. It prays for a miracle. We say that visitors here are miracles. You heard 
Pastor Shub say that last week. We believe that. That people don't come to church just because they decide to, but somehow God moves in them so that someone new here, we can say that is a thing that God does. People continue in the church. People endure in the church. People flourish in the church because God does it. You are a miracle. Your life here is an act of God. But here's the thing about praying for a miracle. As I read these lessons today, God does the main action. In fact, there's very little that anybody else does. God raises the bones. God makes them rattle around. God is the one who puts flesh back on them. And God is the one who breathes his breath into the valley of dry bones. It is God who calls Lazarus out, not the crowd. But God calls people to do something at every stage in both of these stories. God could just raise the dry bones, but he calls Ezekiel to look, and he calls Ezekiel to speak, and he calls Ezekiel to a prayerful prophecy. Jesus could go by himself to Bethany, but the disciples go because they are called to witness and to believe. Martha is called into conversation and into action to go to her sister and say, the master is calling for you. He gives Martha that thing to do. Mary is at home and the mourners are with her and she is called out. For those of you who are here, who have left your homes, you know the difference, don't you? In worshiping together in person and in staying at home and watching us online, there is something different about being called out and being here with Jesus. Some are called there to weep with Jesus. Some are called to roll back the stone. Some are called to unbind the now living body. They're called into the ministry of Jesus. It is as though God answers the prayer and says what God will do and then waits until someone does some small part and then God does what only God can do yes we believe that God will strengthen the faithful and arouse the careless and restore the penitent and move the visitor and welcome the stranger but God does that through prophets and disciples and through family and through the church I'm reading two good books right now on being a church one is on church program design and one is on a new way of evangelism this week they made the same point using different words but here's the point that came up in both books when I'm preparing this sermon it is that their plans do not work their plans will not grow a church because only God can grow a church and only God grows a church when people invite their friends the big difference in dying churches and growing churches is not the quality of Sunday school. It is not the quality of music or the quality of preaching. It is that in some churches, people are excited enough to share the good news of what's going on in their church with people they know, and in some churches, they are not. This is the last sermon in the series on how to get ready for Easter. I hope over the last five weeks, you've heard some things that resonate with you and that you've thought about how you might put into practice. I hope hope you've taken some some time here to build the habit and the ability to set aside what the prayer book calls the cares and occupations of this mortal life and to listen in this hour for the voice of God and to look for the action of God and to focus on God, which is the heart of what we mean by worship. I hope that you've learned to make church a priority, to choose carefully what you pick up and what you put down so that this is a time when you can be in church. I hope that you have learned some stillness and some unhurried presence and that you have practiced greeting people you know and people that you don't in a warm and welcoming way. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to practice 
being part of the miracle of the visitor. Can you think of someone in your life, someone you know, whom you hope will be sitting next to you on Easter Sunday? Are there people that you know that would make Easter a more joyful celebration if they were here with you? Can you think of how to do that? Can you think of what you might say to God about them? Can you find a way to pray that God opens a way for you to invite them to speak good words about what is happening with you in this place and to say you think they might like it too? Are you willing to be an instrument of grace? Are you willing to be part of a miracle? Or are you willing to invite someone to church on Easter? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.